Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorene Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Today we have an icon of American literature, Navarre Scott Mamaday, known as N. Scott Mamaday. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, I was just thinking that if I spent any time introducing you of all of your accomplishments and awards, the show would be over. So I'm going to give the very short version. You're a poet, novelist, playwright, painter, storyteller, professor, House Made of Dawn. This is an extraordinary book. You got the Pulitzer Prize for fiction for House Made of Dawn, and you were the first Native American to win the Pulitzer Prize. What was that like? Um, I have a funny story about that. You know, I didn't know that the book was under consideration at all. Oh, my. And one day, I was living in Santa Barbara at the time, <clears throat> and uh, I got a call from my editor at Harper and Row, and she said, Scott, are you sitting down? And uh, I wasn't, but I should have been. And I said, uh, what is it, uh, Fran? I'm busy. Uh, and she Don't. said, well, you've just won a Pulitzer Prize. And I said, sure I have. Now, really, I'm busy. What do you yeah. want? And finally it sunk in, and uh, I had won the Pulitzer Prize. It made, a, it made a considerable difference in my life because I didn't know quite what to do after that. So it took me a while to get back to writing. Well, everyone else knew what to do after that because that was the breakthrough of Native American literature into the American mainstream. And you were then the creator of what is called the, uh, the classic Native American, uh, it's a classic of Native American literature, and what do they call it, the Native American Renaissance of literature. That's, uh, yeah, that was a term that was coined by a friend of mine. Ken. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, so what did you do after that? Uh, I, I uh, procrastinated quite a while, and then I finally got back to doing some writing. It took a little while. It made a difference. I got a lot of junk mail after that. Oh, yeah. And, and invitations to speak at ladies' garden parties. You probably got a lot of unsolicited manuscripts. And I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a welcome thing, certainly, but it, uh, it, it did have its burdens, too. Um. In 2007, President George W. Bush gave you the National Medal of the Arts, the highest honor any artist in America can receive. I was very pleased and grateful, of course. And what, what was that like? It was great. It was at the White House, and uh, the, the honorees were just very, very reputable, you know, noted, famous people. So I certainly was uh, thrilled to be a part of that. It was great. Among your other honors, of course, you are the Oklahoma Centennial Poet Laureate. You're a New Mexico mm -hmm. Distinguished Centennial Writer. Uh, you got the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Native Writers Circle of the Americas. Um, Fulbright's, uh, no, Guggenheim, you founded. What is the Buffalo Trust? Because you were the founder and the director. The Buffalo Trust is a nonprofit organization designed to help indigenous peoples hold on to their traditional way of life their values. Uh, so it's, uh, it has been dormant for a while because I had uh, some health problems, but uh, I'm trying to revive it now, so I'm hoping it'll do, do well again. It's done good work. And uh, you are one of the founders mm -hmm. of the Amer Museum of the American Indian, a branch of the Smithsonian, and they say you are the voice of this museum. I did some uh, recordings and, you know, radio interviews with uh, for them so I came to be known as the voice of the museum I haven't done anything for them lately though well I'm sure they're you know recycling what you Maybe. did before you've done a lot of work with PBS and with Ken Burns and the West and even a recent piece about the Hamas Mountains mm -hmm. your voice your writing of course on the page has a certain gravitas and authority but your voice is, is very, very powerful. Thank you for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you got a Fulbright. You have worked with the School of Advanced Research in Santa Fe. You worked with UNESCO. They had an international symposium on indigenous identities. You were the keynote speaker. What was that about? 
It was a meeting of um, many nations, of course, in Paris, the headquarters of UNESCO. And I got to, um, I got to uh, moderate uh, a session, and uh, it was a great thrill. They made me um, Artist for Peace, UNESCO Artist for mm. Peace, which is one of my my uh, singular, singular honors. I'm very proud of that. And were you the first American to be given I was the first honor? American to, to be so designated after uh, the U.S. had rejoined UNESCO. Ah. So I'm, there were prob probably Americans before that time. I'm not sure. Yes. I'd just like to briefly look at some of your other books. This one, because storytelling, you are a storyteller for your people, for, our, for all people. And this is when you trace the medicine bundle of the of, of the Kiowa, your Kiowa. This is called the journal, the journey of Tai Mei. Exactly. Yeah. And then you expanded it with drawings by your father to this beautiful book, The Way to Rainy Mountain. So thank you very much. Um, your father was an artist. Your mother was a writer, and now you are both an artist and a writer. Talk about your background. I grew up in a very creative household. My father, as you say, was a painter, a noted painter, and uh, um, I have uh, some of his work, thank goodness, um, hanging on the walls. We've just hung some of his work. And my mother was a writer. She wrote um, a classic called Owl in the Cedar Tree, which is a mm. juvenile about a Navajo boy. And um, so I was exposed to creative um, um, people, big, creative work from the time I was able to understand language. I watched my father paint. I didn't myself want to become a painter until I was well into my adulthood. I wanted to follow in my mother's footsteps, which I did. I became a writer fairly early on. But uh, in Russia, I went to Russia uh, on Fulbright in 1974. It was a great experience because it was behind the Iron Curtain at the time. Ah. And I didn't know what to expect. I'd read Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, but uh, it turned out to be a very different world. Not very comfortable, but fascinating. Mm. And I started drawing there for some reason, and that, that opened up into painting and printmaking and so on. So I came to painting fairly late, but I'm really involved in it now. Yes, you are. And, and um, we, I hope to do another show with you if, in the future about some of your art, some of the shields that you've done and, and the medicine bundles and then terrific masks and faces. But we'll, we'll mm. say that for another time. You uh, got to hang out with some artists and uh, you do tell just the most wonderful story about after you, I, I don't know what, what year it was, but you were Miss O'Keefe. Georgia O'Keefe had invited you to come and visit her after you became a well-known writer. And can you tell us that story, it is, it is a wonderful story. I think it was 1972. I was living here in Santa Fe, <clears throat> and I had a note from George O'Keefe inviting me to come uh, visit her. She was living in Abiquiu at the time. And so I, I believe it was a February day, quite cold, and I drove up uh, nervous because I thought so much of her as an artist, and I was delighted to meet her. Well, I went to her door, and I knocked, and... Um, she came to the door in a tuxedo. She affected the wearing of black and white, and she was, her hair was swept back, and she was these beautiful, large artist's hands. She invited me in, and we sat down in her living room, and she was doing her rock paintings, as she called them at the time. And the objects in the, in the room were wonderful. She had window boxes full of rocks, stones. She loved to go out into the arroyas and pick up beautiful stones. And uh, she showed me the fireplace she had made with her own hands. And uh, there were objects of art. There was, a remember, a, the skeleton of a snake in a glass case. Uh. And uh, so we sat down and talked. And after a while, it occurred to, to George O'Keefe that she had neglected to offer me refreshment. And so she excused herself. She said, oh, what, what would you like to drink? And I, I said, oh, I, I'm perfectly happy. Don't bother but she had got it into her head that I was going to have a drink. So I said, well, uh, scotch and soda, something like that. All right. She absented herself and went out in the direction of the kitchen and did not return. And I sat there wondering and becoming steadily more nervous, what happened to George O'Keefe? She was in her 80s at the time. 
Uh, and I thought, has she, is she in trouble? Should I go and investigate, or would that only embarrass her? And so I sat there, and um, then there came this sound of pots and pans banging in the kitchen. Didn't know what to make of that, you know. And uh, finally, after quite a while, she returned, and she was flustered. And she said, oh, dear, it's my maid's day off, and I don't know what she did with the key to the liquor pantry. <laughs> and so, to my dismay, she upset, upset herself again, went to the kitchen, left me there, and uh, I was, you know, just beginning to really become concerned, and again, the banging of pots and pans. And, and to make a long story short, after beads of blood had appeared on my forehead and I developed a tick, which is recurrent, she returned with my drink on a silver tray. And it turns out that this octogenarian great artist had taken the pantry doors off at the hinges <laughs> with a screwdriver to give me my drink. So, of course, I had to write a poem about it, and I did. Of course. Uh, thank you. Thank you for telling <laughs> that. I, I do love that story. And and it's, it's such a perfect thing because you are the storyteller not only of, of these ancient traditions, but... Of, a, of an event like that starring one of our cultural heroes. That story, I hope, goes on. Oral goes tradition on. just picks up all the time, you know. Yes. It's everywhere. Yeah. Yes. But you are, uh, uh, among other things, a professor of, of creative writing and poetry. And, and um, how do you um, evoke from your students this sense of... of carrying on the tradition of preserving storytelling, of, of preserving the ancient traditions and myths of even of our time, let alone our ancestors. You know, all you have to do is make them aware, make your students aware of the fact that oral tradition is alive and well. Um, Peter Farb, who wrote an interesting book called Wordplay, says that over half the population of the world does without writing at this time which indicates that the oral tradition is very strong in the world, and certainly it's strong among Native American people. So I have spent a lifetime um, studying oral tradition and uh, telling my students that, you know, we have two main traditions in literature. One is writing and the other is oral tradition. And in some ways, oral tradition is more vital than writing because it, le it, it exists at the level of the human voice and it's immediate. And, you know, you take uh, people who do not have writing take storytelling very seriously because they must. You know, it's always, the story is always one generation from extinction. So you have to listen and you have to remember what you hear. And that makes it, uh, it makes it more fragile in a way, but also more vital. And the best example of oral tradition that we have in our time is theater. Mm. You know, if you go see a production of Hamlet, there is oral tradition right before your eyes. It's a wonderful thing. And you talk about the tremendous difference between reading Hamlet on the page mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. seeing it performed. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Both things are worthwhile, but the seeing the production and hearing the voices and feeling the, the body language and the eye contact and all of that makes it very vital and exciting. Well, we're speaking today with N. Scott Mamaday, poet, storyteller, novelist, author. Here's his memoir. It's called The Names. And what you've done is, is preserve these names in your family and your life really forever in this book. And uh, one or two of your other books, again, The Far Morning, a beautiful, beautiful collection of writing. And here you are again, The Man Made of Words. That's you, yes. Mm -hmm. So do your students, um, can they look at their own lives and see what can be preserved? Do people even go past their grandparents' memories? You know, most, uh, most people in our society, I'm talking about contemporary America, don't have a, a, a keen sense of their heritage. You know, very few of my students can tell me about the lives of their great-grandparents, for example, or even their grandparents. It's a sad thing. But if they make the effort, you know, they can find out things that, are, that, that can and, and ought to be very valuable to them. So I tell them that, and um, 
I think uh, part of the job of a teacher is to inspire. Mm -hmm. So I try to inspire my students. And if you, if you can do that, uh, they, they can take over and, and uh, do much of the work for themselves. By the way, I'm um, artist in resident at St. John's this term. Well, I guess indefinitely. But I'm meeting some very gifted students. They're very bright up there, and they, they, uh, you know, you, I've I've had seminars this past Wednesday. We talked about one of Peter Bruegel's paintings called mm. "The Hunters in the Snow," and I all I had to do was say, you know, Peter Bruegel lived in the 16th century, and this is one of the great landscapes in American art history. And they go from there. They take it over. They're prepared, and they talk. And for an hour, I've, I do nothing but uh, ask an equa occasional question and listen to them. And I learn a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been to some readings. You also teach at IAIA, the yeah. Institute of American Indian Arts. Mm -hmm. And I've been to recitals of some of your students mm -hmm. who read their poetry, and, and mm -hmm. I'm just dazzled. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's just so powerful and and such a wide spectrum from humor to pathos to mm -hmm. I mean this is really really good stuff so if you're working with this caliber of student are you optimistic about oh yes I'm very optimistic I I think good things are happening out there you know young people are coming up and they're they're much better prepared than their than earlier generations they have really uh, overcome the language barrier in most instances so they write in English, and they write well in English, and more and more publications, and uh, I think we're about to see something very important from indigenous peoples in this country. Um, this, the, the Christian tradition in the beginning was the word, is actually, the word is so important in, in most traditions, but do your students, do you, are they, uh, is the sacredness of the word still viable? Do people still the sacredness of of the spoken word? Absolutely, absolutely. You take a Navajo child, for example. He grows up uh, certainly knowing some of the prayers from Navajo curing ceremonies, and they're beautiful. Some of the greatest poetry I know is is in you know native languages, and um, it's transcribed, of course. But the beauty comes through and. Um, yeah, they're, they're well-versed, most of them, in storytelling. They have a lot to teach us, you know, who, who grow up in the written tradition. Well, for example, even the title, House Made of Dawn, that chant that, that the hero sings as he runs, House Made of Paul and House Made of Dawn, mm -hmm. when in English this title, House Made of Dawn, fell into literature in 1969, it just people just perked up. What, what does it mean? And then they could see the whole cultural context of it. It was mm -hmm. such a gift. I, I agree. That prayer from the night chant for yeah. House Made of Dawn ends, you know, with beauty all around us. And yes. it's such a wonderful, wonderful uh, poem, as it were. And that must be the most quoted piece of Native American literature because I wouldn't be surprised. people are so um, moved by... Of the observation of beauty before us, beauty behind us. Yeah. And that's a lovely way to walk through life. The, the best way. The yes, best way. yes. So mm -hmm. you are artist in residence, you're teaching. You've recently married a marvelous poet, and I want to urge anyone in the listening audience, you have been doing a series of poetry readings with you and Kathleen uh, to the accompaniment of a cello, and you read poetry to each other. And it, I was so privileged to attend a couple of these readings, and I think you are creating a, a wonderful kind of flame, a wonderful art form there in that dialogue. So We are writing a dialogue in haiku, you know. It's, uh -huh. uh, so I'm very excited about that, and uh, she is a wonderful poet. So I'm anxious to see what comes of that. I think we'll have a nice publication fairly soon. But you have a history of a little more mischievous haikus. I do. Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Some of your short poems are really fun yeah. and delightful. And, yeah. um, and, so, and then your longer pieces, too. So how often do you write? I mean, are you writing every day? No, not at the moment. I'm doing more painting than writing uh -huh. at the moment. But um, I need to get back to my writing. I work on a, try to work on a schedule that uh, gives me 
mornings free to write. And uh, after, say, four hours of writing, I'm ready to do something else. Mm -hmm. It's good to go from writing to painting in my case. They're both expressions of the spirit. They both require concentration, but the writing requires far more. Uh, I can listen to a ball game and paint. We can't do that in writing. And they both use different parts of your brain. Yeah. And so, and that's, um, they said Leonardo da Vinci had the most balanced human brain because he was such a sophisticated artist and such a sophisticated scientist and writer. Yes. You're getting up there. Yeah. Good company. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you, in your medicine bundle paintings and your shields, these are power objects that, um, that you put in a cultural context, but how can the rest of this culture that does not have that tradition, how can they look for objects that can give them strength and inspiration in the American cultural life? Is there any possible... Um, Trans, translation there? Is there? I think so. I think uh, until you said in contemporary American life, I was thinking of um, literature and, of course, such, such things as the Holy Grail ah, and, and objects an of that kind, which you can encounter in literature uh -huh. and find inspiration and find ways of, um, of bringing such things into your life and giving your life meaning. I would say that uh, contemporary Americans might look to Native Americans and their, you know, veneration for holy objects and place, places especially. Uh, I'm Kiowa, and uh, when I was an infant, I was taken to Devil's Tower, which the Kiowas called Tsoai, which means isn't rock that tree. part of your own name? It's it part of my name. My Indian name is Tsoai Tali, which means rock tree boy. Mm -hmm. And I was given that name to commemorate my having been taken to this sacred place. Well, there are all kinds of um, such places in America that are sacred to Native peoples. And if uh, the non-Native, you know, looks into those things, I think it can find inspiration and meaning in them. Well, we have much to learn from the Native communities, one of which is that, as you have said, I'm quoting you, that Earth is a spirit, not a commodity. Mm -hmm. And and in this time of climate change and a lot of turmoil, mm -hmm. we need to look. I mean, there the the pattern is set has been set for thousands of years by the Native Americans and other Native peoples. That's right, exactly right. But how can you translate that? Make that accessible to? I mean, young people definitely feel the rightness of it. But what about you know? I'm, I'm still trying to find a way to bridge that gap for people to realize that to look at the spirit of things and not their monetary or commercial value. You find it in story and in literature. You know, I think if you read uh, something like um, um, The Way to Rainy Mountain mm. and uh, the introduction to that book uh, talks about sacred places and uh, if you become aware of them I think Something rubs off on you. You you, uh, you are affected by the spirit of the place and the piece, the story, and it uh, it gives you a kind of energy that you didn't have before, and appreciation of the earth. And at, at best, we have that with any sense of history. There are historical places that, although they do not particularly have the spiritual um, impact, they're at least. Um, honored and reverence, uh, revered because of that's how we got here, these historical things. Mm -hmm. And then if you extend that back, I look at the journey of Taime, this uh, fetish, the sacred symbol that was, you, you say, stolen by the Osage at one yes, point. This yes, was right. a, the, the yes. spiritual heart of, of the Kiowa people. And of course, their enemies, that's how they would get to you. They would take the spiritual heart. That was a cruel and singularly oppressive blow when time it was stolen. Fortunately, it was, it was returned. and uh, so Was it captured or returned voluntarily? I think it was returned uh, because the federal government asked the Osages to return it in order ah. to keep the peace. And they complied, so it was a good thing. Well, we see that even uh, last year there was a of a lot of Hopi masks for sale, for yes. sale. Yes, 
And even though the people of the world said, give them back to their people, these are spiritual objects, these are not commodities. Mm -hmm. And it took a, a foundation to, to finally purchase them and then to give them back to the mm -hmm. Hopi. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, we applaud whenever we see that. Sometimes it doesn't always go that way. Do you have, a, we've almost run out of time, do you have some words for the people who are listening to this? Well, I thank them for listening, and I hope that we've given them some something to be interested in and uh, maybe uh, encourage them to look farther into the subject. And to look farther into your books, just let me remind our viewers, Pulitzer Prize winning House Made of Dawn, um, because you are the man made of words, Scott Momaday's Man Made of Words, and this one that I do love so much, The Journey of Time A. This is the archetypical story of your people, expanded with his dad's illustrations, The Way to Main Rainy Mountain. So our guest today is N. Scott Momaday. Tell us about your name. The N stands for? Stands for Navarre, and uh, my mother tells me that, told me that uh, Way back in her ancestry, some of her family came from the province of Navarre, which is Basque country now. It's ah. southern Spain and northern, um, uh, no, it's uh, southern France and northern Spain. Uh -huh. So I have that in my background as well. And I, do, I know very little about, about uh, those people. I've been through Basque country, and uh -huh. the language terrifies me. <laughs> so it's so, you know... Difficult.